Hello, everyone. This is um, Claudio Murgan, the host of uh, the Spiritual Inspire show. And my guest today is Jonathan Hammond. Uh, before beginning his work in holistic uh, health and spirituality, Jonathan had a very successful career as an award winning actor appearing on Broadway and television. His University of Michigan education in musical theater performance led to postgraduate work with the American Repertory Theater, Moscow Art Theater Institute for Advanced Theater Training at Harvard University. Jonathan now devotes his life to being deeply committed to empowering and healing people by bringing indigenous earth wisdom to the modern world as a master teacher and faculty member for shamanic Reiki worldwide. Driven by his background and interest in energy healing, Jonathan has apprenticed with shamans in Brazil, Mexico, Bali, and Hawaii. He runs yoga and spiritual retreats around the world and is the founder of a private spiritual counseling and shamanic practice in New York City, known as Mind, Body, Spirit, New York City. He also authored um, The Shaman's Mind, an amazing book, which uh, we'll uh, talk about it um, today. So uh, <clears throat> thank you for, for joining me today, Jonathan. Aloha. It's really great to be here, Claudia. Nice to see you. Aloha. Um, I know that, uh, you know, in fact, you are the second person I know which used to be an actor and switched to his um, spiritual uh, calling. So what was your turning point when the, the lights of Broadway became not that glamorous anymore? Well, actually, I actually write about it in the book. It actually happened on the volcano in Maui. I, I, had, been, uh, I had been contemplating the idea of, of a life change, but it was a tumultuous life change because it was the only thing I ever felt like I... Uh, I was, I, you know, I did my first play when I was four, you know, so, um, but I had been called in, uh, I, I'd always been, since my early 20s, I've had a, a very rich spiritual life, and the spiritual life just kept taking up more space than the, uh, than the acting life, and then um, on the Haleakala volcano in Maui, I, I received, I can only describe it as kind of a vision, and, uh, and I had an experience that, um, and receive a message that it was time to move on and it was time to time to let that go. You know, also, it's, it's so funny when people introduce me with that with the acting thing, because it feels so far away. It was, it was uh, you know, I retired uh, uh, quite a while ago. You know, I can say now that that um, when you think about what an actor does, you know, they they learn the lines, they learn the blocking and then they hope for inspiration to come through. And so uh, and in a way, it's very much like channeling. And um, and so my work now, I'm, I'm using actually a lot of the same muscles, you know, um, uh, it, it's not really, it's not really uh, in some ways all that, all, all that different. It's, it's very related. Um, and and you, people, people who are, uh, uh, you know, have a propensity towards uh, artistry, you know, oftentimes they feel that sense of, they know what it's like to be in inspiration. And so it's not that big of a leap toward, uh, you know, a, a, another way of, um, another way, another career. Yes, yeah, so you are very connected to um, Hawaii, to, to Huna, uh, which is the spiritual teaching of uh, Hawaii. So how would you compare Huna um, against uh, the other indigenous um, traditions in North or South America? How there are correlations yeah. between them? Well, what I found fascinating about it, I, I, I've worked with shamans in Central America, North America, the Far East, Hawaii, South America. I'm trying to think if there's anywhere else, but I think that's it. And, uh, and what I found was that they all adhered to surprisingly similar worldviews and practices, even though some of the practices might be slightly different or they would emphasize different things or minimize other things, um, uh, or even, even the culture might be wildly differently different. They were all in some way thinking the same way. And when I came across the Huna philosophy, which comes out of, uh, out of Hawaii, and Hawaii has just been something that has grabbed my imagination since I've been there. I didn't know to look there for, for spiritual um, uh, significance. It just, it just I, I found that the land itself was speaking to me. And then as I del dove into Hawaiian spirituality, it was like, aha. And what I, what I found in the Huna philosophy, which is an esoteric shamanic philosophy that is about how from my perspective, the reason why I named my book The Shaman's Mind is because it's about how shamans think, how they tend to see the world, how they relate to energy, how they relate to the present moment, how they relate to um, what they're focusing on, how they relate to 
um, um, even how they organize their thoughts, intentions, and actions. And what I found cross-culturally was that all shamans that I had worked with adhered to these, um, these ideas. I didn't know that they would all be put in one place which is what I found in the Huna philosophy. And that's why, that's why it meant so much to me. So I named the book, The Shaman's Mind, because it's by adopting that philosophical outlook that anyone can enter into seeing the world through the lens of the shaman's mind. And in fact, they don't need two or three PhDs to go into that trance and connect with divinity and get the messages. It's just, you know, pure connectivity. Yeah, when you talk about shamanism, is extremely childlike. You know, uh, if you think of, you know, shamans are, are dreaming into imaginary lands. They are connecting with invisible friends. They are playing with bells and rattles and drums and, and, uh, and, uh, and animal friends, you know. So, so uh, to practice shamanism is to go back to something that we all in some way did when we were children. But, um, but uh, to, to study shamanism and become a, pract a practitioner is to actually know that we were actually doing something as children. We were actually entering into different ways of seeing the world and different realities. And so the shaman journeys into these different realities in order to connect with wisdom, to connect with the invisible realms, to retrieve power. Um, and, 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 and we all in some way uh, uh, know how to do that on some level. So do you think that that childlike um, attitude is connecting to our soul or to something else? Yeah, I, I, think, I think it's connecting to that which we can't see. So if you think of, if you think of uh, um, uh, consensus reality being um, um, uh, one small slice in an apple pie and shamanic reality being the rest of the pie, so there is so much that does not meet the eye. There is so much that is hidden. There is so much in our inner worlds uh, and, uh, and in, the, in the inner worlds of, of nature that, that we can actually tune into. When you think about something like, like ayahuasca or plant medicine, at some point, someone actually journeyed into a plant and said, I need a little bit of this and a little bit of that and a little bit of that based on what the plant was telling them. In order to in order to um, uh, to create plant medicine, so in shamanism we we are revering nature, because nature uh, uh, because when we connect with nature we connect with a, a force that that is happening inside of us and that we see mirrored in nature. When you when you think of a forest and you leave that forest alone to kind of do its thing, that forest will continue an endless process of growth and creation. It will just keep going. It just wants to keep going. And, and, everything, and everything in the forest is connected to that intentionality. And we as being in nat beings of nature are actually no different. We are connected to everything. That force of growth and creation is always flowing through us. That's why there's this feeling of satisfaction when we move towards that which is inspiring or aspiring where, 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 where we're growing and why we don't feel so good when we're ta taking actions that are antithetical to our growth and creation. Because the more that we align with nature, the more we align with the organizing principle of the planet, which is to just keep going, to grow and to create. And anything that would want to keep going, that would want to just continue to experience more of itself, what would be the intentionality underneath the, the, the force of nature? Love. Anything that wants to just keep going is love. And so the whole thing is operating on love. And the more that we choose love as a path, the more that we are in alignment with the, the flow of nature, with the flow of, of life continuing as it is. Yes, indeed. And I interviewed uh, other guests and they told me that they talk to plants and uh, it's a beautiful, beautiful feeling to, to hear, uh, you know, their voices and uh, being guided how to, to combine them in order to heal their uh, patients and yes it's, it's a beautiful uh, feeling i assume i only once um felt that i the plant talked to me um you know during a ayahuasca ceremony and uh, again was was beautiful yeah. well you know let me say this you know we're, we're we're swimming in all different kinds of realities all the time you know you go watch cnn you watch the news that's one reality you go watch a different news station that's another reality you go to a trump rally that's another reality there's all different kinds of realities and uh, the Huna philosophy says the, that the world is what you think it is. 
which means that we create the world based on what we think. So if you decide to adopt the reality that if I take a walk in the forest, that forest will start talking to me if I ask that forest a question, then just by virtue of your intentionality of entering into that reality, that forest will start talking to you. Yes, yeah. So I recently heard, uh, I mean, more and more about the um, whole Pono Pono um, philosophy. How does it fit into, into HUNA? Uh, how does it fit into HUNA? Well, um, uh, in addition to that, there are seven principles in HUNA that we follow that are, as I said, are sort of the easiest uh, uh, and most practical way in which we can enter into seeing through the lens of the shaman's mind. Um, uh, then in addition to that, there are, there are in, in the HUNA philosophy, they talk about three different spirits that we possess or three different souls that we possess. Our spiritual soul or spiritual uh, self our, um, our conscious mind self and the unconscious mind. And held in the unconscious mind or the unconscious body mind is all our wounding. It's, it's what we learned as children that, that uh, in some way obscures our divinity. So when we, are, uh, when we are mistreated, when we're neglected, when we're misunderstood, when we simply constrict against the pain of the world, in some way we take that on as a part of our um, a way of being, you know, so, so um, uh, this is the, the seeds of low self-esteem, the seeds of I'll never get, I don't have enough, I'll never, I'll never be, I, I don't look right, uh, um, I'm not intelligent, all of that wounding. And so the Ho'oponopono um, is a, a Hawaiian practice where we actually work with all three of those selves, the spiritual self, the mental self, and the unconscious body-mind self that holds the problem. And in, in aligning those three, we teach this inner child to let go of these misbeliefs that we have about ourselves. And we do that over and over and over again um, in, in the Ho'oponopono practice so that we can let go of, of that which obscures our, uh, our intentionality to love. And we all, hope, we all have that wounding. And so Ho'oponopono is just a, a very effective, practical uh, not only practice, it is uh, definitely a, a practice that you can do individually, but it's a really way of thinking and taking care of yourself where, uh, where you are really addressing when that stuff comes up in us, the doubt, the fear, the, the anxiety, the addiction, you know, that we are actually attending to it, doing something about it, reparenting it. And that's the Ho'oponopono practice. So you said there are seven steps. Can you please briefly just mention them without going into details yeah sure sure uh so there's seven uh seven principles in the huna philosophy the first one as i mentioned the world is what you think it is which means not just that your experience of the world will be based on how you think about it but that the world itself reality itself will create it itself based on how you think about it so that means that we're in a co-creative relationship with the world based on what's going on between our ears so that's the first principle second principle says there are no limits which means that it is a limitless universe, which means that separation is merely an illusion. So that means that there's only one great big thing happening. And we are each an individual aperture through which that one thing experiences itself. Or another way to think of it is that we are each individual waves in an ocean that can't separate ourselves from the ocean. So that, that's that principle. There are no limits. There's no separation. Third, the, the uh, third principle is uh, energy flows where at our attention goes. So where we place our focus and attention elicit the creative energy that bring to us the nearest physical equivalent of whatever we're putting our focus and attention on. So just by focusing on something with consistency, we are all energy workers because focus invites in energy. And the more that we focus on something, the more energy that's produced to bring that thing into being. So energy flows where attention goes. The next principle is now is the moment. And by the way, these are all based on seven Hawaiian words that are unique translations of these words uh, by my teacher, Serge Kihili King. Uh, the, the fourth principle, now is the moment of power. So we, and we know a lot about mindfulness and being in the present moment. And we, we've, we've heard all of that. But it, this principle is really getting at that now is the only place where one can access power because now is the only place where you can do anything. So it's, a, so it's about really recognizing that, that who we think we are 
is based only on who we think we are right now. In the Hawaiian language, there are no past, in the, in the actual language, there are no past or future tenses. <laughs> everything is only in the now and everything uh, ends in such a way that you can think of the language almost as if it's, um, that everything is a gerund. Everything is almost, uh, there's a, a sense of that, it, that everything is a verb. Everything is happening right now, you know? Yes. Yeah, so, so that's that principle. Now is the moment of power. You can only do anything right now. Uh, the next principle, aloha, which you, know, which you know from Hawaii. And really, that just means that because love, as the organizing principle uh, on the planet, it is the organizing principle on the planet, that love's perspective must be included in our thoughts and our actions and our deeds. And it's just saying that love is the only ethic. Love is the litmus test that decides what we're supposed to be doing. Is love present? The next principle, uh, um, now, uh, mana, which means all power comes from within. Now, this is a big one because it's saying that all power, all authority only comes from within me or from within you. I have all the power and so do you. So even something outside of us that seems to have authority over us only has authority over us insofar as the authority in us grants that thing authority over us. And this is a big one, particularly in this culture, because we're so mired in what everyone thinks. We're so mired in how am I doing? Why, how am I looking? What, what does everyone think? You know, what, what does the family think? What is, how am I fitting in? How am I assimilating? And this principle it really speaks so that the only truth is through you. Yes, and I will add that all the joy comes from within as well. That's right. That's right. That's right. Absolutely. And, and again, because the, because the world is what you think it is. So you can, you can, uh, you can be looking at a beautiful landscape and admiring it and admiring the nature, or you could be looking at a beautiful landscape with, with a stomach ache and have an entirely different experience of that landscape, you know. And the last principle is effectiveness is the measure of truth, which means that it's only if it works that we consider it to be true. So the only absolute truth, according to this philosophy, is that everything is. Everything else is just something that someone made up. And it's only in adhering to what works for you that we decide what is true for us individually. You see how it's so empowering? And it puts the responsibility on you, knowing that you, you, create, the, you create the world with your thoughts. Uh, um, it, there's, there's limitless opportunity to do that. Uh, you elicit energy when you do that. You can only do it in the present moment. Choose love, because that really helps. You have all the power to do that. And if it doesn't work, no big deal. Just try something else. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> And some of these principles are being taught by scientists right now and other people in uh, all, all over the world. And uh, doctor uh, or no, scientist Carl Kalman from, uh, from Sweden has a um, theory in, and he put it in one of his books about the fact that this download came uh, on earth at a specific time and everyone on earth got it at the same time, no matter where they were on earth. Um, so that's why there are, in my opinion, based on what I learned from him, um, there are so many similarities and people right now are just rediscovering this, uh, these teachings. Yeah, there, there is a, a theory which makes a lot of sense to me that, uh, that uh, Hawaii, which is so surrounded in water, and when you think of water, water is in some way the blood of the planet, which means that it holds our DNA. And many people believe that Hawaii and that area, the middle of the South Pacific, was the recipient of um, esoteric wisdom, either from the heavens or from other corners of the, of the globe, but that it all conglomerated there, or that it originated there and then was sent out into the world. And because it's, because it's so connected to water, the idea is, is that that esoteric wisdom is in the, DNA of the, in, the, in the DNA of the earth, which means it's in the DNA of us. Yes. So, uh, because we're, we're, we're almost 100% water. And so the idea is, is that, is that this, all this material may be lying latent in you, but that it's part of your DNA if you choose and you, uh, if you, choose and you want to, to excavate it and understand it. You know, yes. there, was, there was a book that came out, I think, in the 90s called The God Molecule. Uh, you know, uh, and it was about, about this, the, the spiritual DNA 
that we all possess that lies latent in us. Yes, and um, I mean, almost in every single discussion I have with um, shamans or energy healers, uh, water comes forward and we discuss about the memory of water and, you know, I write about <clears throat> the memory of water and the awakening of water. Mm -hmm. So it's very interesting that, uh, you know, all of you are kind of vibrating at the same level uh, and have this understanding of how powerful uh, water is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, you know, my exposure to the Hawaiian shamanism came, I think, to th at the end of 2018 when I um, took a course with Hank Wesselman. Also, I read his books. And um, over time, he met with uh, Makua, which was an elder in, in Hawaii, very respected uh, elder. Mm -hmm. They spent a number of years together, and uh, he wrote a book after uh, Makua's death, The Ball of Light. Mm -hmm. And he mentioned that during his workshops in um, Hawaii, um, he will have Makua coming with a group of uh, locals and they will dance together and they will have a ceremony together. Um, do you spice your workshops with uh, something similar or you just uh, keep it uh, on a lower note? Um, well, uh, you know, my, my, my teachers are always with me. My teacher, my teacher, Serge King, who's I think 84, who lives on the big island of Hawaii and um, uh, just one of the most, first of all, one of the most present individuals I've ever met. I, I met him when I was, I think he was about 81 when I met him. Uh, it hasn't been that long. And I remember after him teaching a whole day long workshop, the next day we came in in the morning and he said, I watched the most interesting documentary last night, but I decided to put it, um, to change it to Portuguese so I could translate it for my wife in Portuguese just to work on my Portuguese at 81 after a day of teaching. Just that awake, that aware. It's just, um, uh, amazing person, and so so there are um, there are some gifts that he has given me, uh, literal physical physical gifts, physical tools uh, that I, that I always wear when I when I uh, teach his material. So he always feels um, uh, he always feels very close to me. And you know, let me say this too: as much as as much as uh, I have a teacher in Hawaii, I have a, uh, an American um, uh, shamanic teacher who I who mainly I think borrows from uh, Russian uh, uh, from. Uh, Siberian uh, uh, shamanism, um, that what, what's happening on the planet right now is the recognition that there really is only one mind. And, and that, that if, uh, if you, uh, the explosion of esoteric wisdom, the explosion of shamanic wisdom that has only really been within the last 30, 40 years is happening for a reason, the spiritual intelligences know what they're, they're doing. And, and it's so available to us because we need it at this time on the planet. So as much as I honor coming from different lineages, at the end of the day, we're all tuning into the same thing. All, I, I always joke that all roads lead to Rome in terms of, in, uh, in terms of truth, you know? And, and so just to say that too, because I, I think that it's, it's important to address cultural appropriation and that sort of thing, but it's also important to address that we no longer as a species, as a planet, have time for even that separation. If you're tuning into it, it's because it's part of the one mind. And I think that that's so important that we recognize. So if you or any of the listeners have found your way to any esoteric material, use it. You found it for a reason. And we yes. don't have time for you not to. Yes, and even you're, if you're part of a religion, um, you really have to go deeper in order to get that connection to the divinity. So no religion is better than the other, as long as it takes you to the top of the mountain. Effectiveness um, is the measure of truth. Exactly. So if it works for you, yeah. And if it takes you there and you reach that moment, you really understand that in the end, religion can be there or be missing. It's not important. Is the, the journey and the end point, in fact, which really, really matters. That's right. And going back to your uh, teachers, as you said, you had uh, many teachers. What it takes to become an apprentice, either on South America, North America, Hawaii, what really takes to... Well, it depends. It depends. The Hawaiian tradition, which is, is to me, in terms of that dynamic, the most, uh, the, not the most ingenious and the most e effective, is that, uh, that, the, the, that you have to ask. It's all about asking. So in the Hawaiian tradition, the kahuna, kupua, the, the, the shaman, only responds to the inquiries of the student. 
So the, the, so the, the, the shaman only answers questions and will only answer the exact question being asked. Because the idea is, is that the student has to feel into their own inner world, into their own gut, in order to shift that question in such a way, in order to, to uh, invite in a different answer. So, uh, so um, with, with uh, my teacher, Serge, he, I, I've seen him say, you want to be my apprentice? Okay, be my apprentice. And I'll just stare at you. Because the idea is, is that you're to ask, you're to go to him. You know? And even, even, um, even now, if I have a... Um, if I have a question, he will, ab and I email him, he will absolutely answer it, and he will answer it exactly as I've asked it. And, and, um, and that invites in the next thing, you know? And it's so important that, and what they're getting, what I think is so ingenious about that paradigm is that even in my, in my, uh, in my work as a healer, it's that the people who come to me who actually want to take responsibility for their healing, and who also want to acknowledge the resistance of which we all have, healing and resistance, two sides of the same coin. You can't have one without the other. Resistance will come up. And so when the client is actually willing to acknowledge and work with that resistance and, and, and work with their own process, that's when that, is, because all power comes from within, right? So I can't, I can't heal you. I can only teach you, in, teach you to heal yourself, you know? Um, and so like, like it's such an important paradigm to, to think about it in terms of that the responsibility is on you. Yes, it, it's oh. part, of, part of the dualism process or lifestyle we are, we are going through. So yeah, we have to be aware of that. You know, I often, I often say, you know, just given what's going on on the planet, you know, this is a very low bar, but if we could all just clean up our individual mess enough that it doesn't spill over into another person's experience, if we could just do that, we're not even there, but if we could just do that. And that speaks to the personal responsibility that we all need to take. So is this process of um, us increasing our own vibration and then consciousness or do we have to do something else to to do that to increase the vibration well you know uh <clears throat> i mean i read about this in, in in the beginning of the book you know we're in a very very loaded time we're in a very specific time and it is a time that has been um that has been prophesied by many uh, many indigenous cultures that talk about a very difficult time on the planet and the Quechua people actually speak about this 500 year interval of which we just enter in, entered into. But uh, there are certain um, Native American traditions that talk about this era, the, the, uh, uh, the Hindu Vedic scripture talks about, uh, talks about this yuga or this era. And they talk about a very difficult time on the planet that would get very dark, but at the same time, there would be all of these beings incarnating at that time who were supposed to be part of the, part of the solution you know, this sort of army of light workers, so to speak, you know, and, and we're very much feeling that. And as much as, as much as the old ways of separation and hatred and racism and, and, and greed and dominion over nature, that those ways are very, are very much dying out. And it's even mirrored in, in uh, contemporary brain science, where they talk about the brain that is devolving is the limbic reptilian reactive brain and the brain that is evolving is the one that just wants to help, that is, that is empathic. And so that, there's, a, uh, there's this downfall happening with these old ways and this ascension happening. And the ascension isn't really like anything too spiritual, highfalutin. It's just, it's just people, um, people recognizing that they must recognize non-separation, that they must come from love, that they must empathize, that they must care about the planet the way she cares about us. And, and so that ascension of consciousness is around that. And when you think of the first principle of Huna, the world is what you think it is. The idea that, that what we project onto reality creates reality. What's been projected onto reality has been one of separation, greed, hatred, fear. And that reality has literally <laughs> become sick. Yes. So, you know, so, and, so and now it's about projecting something else and shifting that reality. Yeah. So this idea of increased consciousness that can save us as um, human beings did come to you slowly as a gradual process or is just pop up in your head while meditating or doing a shamanic ceremony? Do you remember? 
Um, certainly all those things. I mean, I can't, I can't, you know, it, I, it wasn't a big aha moment. It's more, it's more about my empathic discernment with the earth. And what I mean by that is, is if the earth just wants to keep going, which all indications say it just really does. And that, and that the earth is mad at us and, and punishes us and brings us difficulties when we are not in alignment with that intentionality. You know, and because we come from the earth, we're made of the earth, you know, fire, fire, water, air, uh, uh, earth, that's what we're made of, you know, so we come from her, we are her. And so if we're not operating from this point of view of, of what can, what are the qualities that I need to cultivate in myself to keep things going? Because we see that when we don't cooperate, when we don't recognize holism, when we don't recognize that we are no different than our neighbor, when we don't recognize that, that people are more important than profits, when the earth is more important than, my, when we don't recognize those things, those are the things that, that make the earth go, I, I, if I have to shake you off like so many fleas, I will. Yes, yeah, <clears throat> and as well because in, in water entanglement, this is the, the idea. Water awakens and punishes us for our misdeeds. Is the way of you know Earth using water as a tool for punishment. So, uh, yeah, and you know even, even just to say even in, in 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 the work that I do, you know when people come to me with a problem or their relationships breaking up or or they're questioning long held values or there's an illness. But this is not some of the time, this is every time. The seeds of a new awareness are held in that difficulty. So when they come to me and they say, but, you know, my life is, you know, shit, it's blown apart. My, my uh, initial thought is great, we can get started. You know, because it's out of that difficulty, out of that darkness that brings the new awareness. And you can see the results pretty much not necessarily right away, but if in the short to, term. Yeah. Yes. And if they're willing to accept that, aha, my fingerprint, even this difficulty, this darkness, my fingerprints are on this. I didn't know that I was necessarily doing that, but my fingerprints are on this. And, and it's not about blame the victim. It's about harnessing the power of responsibility, saying, aha, I see how I've created this, this difficulty. And now, that, now, that I've, and now it's about never again. What did I do to get here? And how can I make sure I never do it again? Yes. Uh, you know. I would like to, to read a paragraph from, uh, from your sure. book. Um, quote, in the last 50 years, we have become inundated with consciousness expanding esoteric wisdom from a host of indigenous and spiritual traditions, and for a good reason. So I want to ask you, don't you find ironic that those considered in the past savages by Western world, um, those we try to decimate uh, are the ones showing us the, the path, guiding us through plant medicine ceremonies, through knowledge transfer to individuals like, like yourself. Um, they are so forgiving in spite of everything they, they went through. Yeah, we're not so smart. We're not so smart. The, you know, the Westerners are not so smart. And, you know, it, um, the, the, inf the infection the, uh, in, the, in the psyche of uh, white European, I'll say males, but I think it's probably more than just males, of their, their superiority. Is just, is just insane. When you think of indigenous mind and you think of these people who basically invite, not invited in, but welcomed the, these people who came to their lands. You know, in the research that I did on, in, in Hawaii, when, when, the, when, the, um, when the Western missionaries and Captain Cook and all those, all, all those people came to Hawaii, it wasn't a sense of you're going to take from me. It was a sense of like, welcome. Oh, you do, you do cattle, you do rifles, you do. And it was this cooper cooperative thing. And what I've since discovered is that what happened to these people was not part of their cosmological view of life. The, the, the idea that they would be that they would be treated in that way that they that 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 kind of selfishness even existed because that kind of selfishness is not mirrored in nature you know the tiger eats the antelope then when the tiger's full the tiger will drink right next to another antelope by the river you know so that kind of selfishness and greed and taking that's not mirrored in nature so it's not in indigenous mind and so there was there was a, such an innocence to what happened to them, you know, that is so devastating. 
Yeah, because you know? it wasn't the ownership of, of ownership of the land. It was the take, the care of the, the land. So it was, yeah, different, different mindset. That's right. Uh, I, was, I was just reading 90% of uh, indigenous Hawaiian, uh, Hawaiians since 17, uh, what it was, 1778, when Catherine Cook came, ha uh, died of disease, died of a disease that, that uh, came from the West. So yeah, it's, um, uh, it, it's, just, it's just what, what has happened. And from my point of view, these people were, lived in peace for millennia. And, and to to re adopt and celebrate their ways and their ways of thinking, even in conjunction with our modern world and our technology. Because it's not about, it's not about you know, we're not all gonna be, you know, live in huts. That's not, you know, that's not part of it. But there is a way to marry all of that and to return to at least the values of which these people lived that we can all do even in the, in the contemporary age. And, um, uh, and, and I, think that that's, I think that's what this is about. It's about coming back to, as the uh, Native Americans might say, right relationship, right relationship with nature, right relationship with the earth, to walk on the earth with humility and reverence and gratitude. Yes, indeed. Um, a prophecy you mentioned in the book, which I really liked was, and I hope I pronounced it correctly, Quehan prophecy. Um, can you please share with us? Sure, the, the Ketchum prophecy. Yeah, so this is one of those prophecies that I talked about. Um, the idea that, that uh, the, the Ketchum people, they divided time into 500 year intervals. And the particular 500 years that we currently are in, they talked about that this is a time when the eagle and the condor would fly together in the same sky. So the previous 2000 years, the Ketchum people believed was dominated by the eagle, materialistic, visionary, intellectual, masculine. But they say that the 500 years that we're entering into is a time when the eagle and the condor, the condor being feminine, intuitive, uh, um, uh, environmentally conscious, um, uh, spiritual, the catch will believe that, that, that the condor is so, so sacred that she might not even fly, she can just spiritually move herself. And so they talk about that it's about these two energies, masculine and feminine, dancing together, flying together in the same sky, that we're coming into a, a different kind of balance where we're inviting in the feminine, the earth wisdom, the, the mother wisdom um, into, into what has previously been um, masculine, which, which, which has been great to science, technology, of, um, uh, thought, reason, all of those things. But we're now needing that the feminine um, energy of the condor to come in. And the catch would talk about that this 500 year interval that we're in is a time when those two energies will, will come together. Yes, and um, I talked to another uh, one of my guests, Anaya Sophia, about the um, feminine side of the masculine. And we have to, to embrace it in order to get that uh, balance and uh, our personal balance then uh, vibrating into the reverber reverberating into the, the world. So that's, that's right. Coming you know, up, yeah. That's right. You know, I, I, um, I, I work, I work with a lot of men, uh, and I, uh, and do a lot of men's work and, and, you know, men, men have not been taught healthy masculinity and because healthy masculinity is about the integration of the feminine feeling our feelings. Men have not been taught that. If you think about the, the archetypes that men aspire to, or what's in the, in the consciousness, it's kind of like, you know, jerk CEO, Marlboro man, uh, uh, Casanova, wuss. Those are their options, you know? And, and what, what's emerging now, really since the, the late 1990s, is this new idea of masculine where we are inviting, where we are asking men to invite in their, their, their feminine side, their emotional side, you know, and that that doesn't make them weak. It's in the holding of the emotions that actually makes a man a man that can actually feel his feelings and act on them. So, you know? so in other words, just to put it in plain words is cry if you have to cry, if you feel like crying and don't be ashamed for what you show. Sure. Okay. Sure. That's yeah. great. Yeah. On your uh, visits to uh, Hawaii and to the Haleakala volcano, did you encounter the uh, goddess uh, Pele? 
Well, I did more, um, uh, you know, on Maui, which is, I, I'm moving to Maui, which Maui is, is very sweet and tranquil. We, the big island is, is, is amazing, but wild. And it feels like Pele is really there. I mean, I'll, I'll, uh, uh, I'll tell you a story. Years ago, this is before Hawaii was even on my radar, but I happened to be on the big island. And, um, and I, went to the, I went to the active volcano, Kilauea, and, um, uh, and it, it was truly a terrifying, it, it's terrifying. You feel like you're on the edge of the world and you cannot believe how big it is, how vast it is. And, there, and it's just this black rock with this sense of this thing underneath. And you know, you would, I, I would stand next to a tree and there would be no wind and the tree would be shaking at me. It was just, it was just like, I, I, when I went to that volcano, I experienced in the parking lot, as I walked through the parking lot, snow, rain, sunlight, a rainbow, a breeze, while I was walking, the place is crazy. And it, it, it just very much feels like, feels like her. And then I, uh, um, I, before, I knew the, before I knew the legend, um, which is that you don't take rocks from the volcano. You don't, you know, you don't take those rocks home. You know, Pele doesn't like that. Um, and before I knew the legend, I was, at the, I was at the hotel after visiting, and I thought, she's so powerful, I want some of these rocks. So I just took some volcanic rock and put it in my, uh, uh, and, and brought it up to my room. And on my, this true story, on my way up the room, I got to my room and the key wouldn't work. And, uh, <laughs> and I had a bag of Pele rocks that I thought I was going to take home. So I went to the front desk and, you know, I'd been at the beach, so I didn't have any ID or anything. They treated me in this beautiful hotel like I was a criminal. Not because of the rocks, just that they wouldn't let me in. I had to go walk two acres to go find, find the person that I was with. They just were not buying that I was saying who I thought I was. And then when I, when I got back, um, I, I, then I started Googling. Something told me to Google rocks from the volcano and everything said leave them there you know uh so it was it was an interesting lesson but yeah pele is um you know she's she's um she's ferocious she's for i mean she's amazing because she's also she's creating she's literally creating more land she's creating more earth as we speak you know but uh very intense energy. Yeah, so very intense very possessive. I learned about this uh, custom from uh, Hank's books. And in yeah. fact, in mine, um, these two characters are walking a Hawaiian and a Canadian walking uh, the beach. And uh, the Hawaiian said, we'll ask that rock if she wants, will the spirit of the rock, if she wants to go Thank with you. you to Canada. And if yes, you can take it. So she takes the rock to Canada, put it in her garden where it was parched. And then life comes, started to, to come back to life. You know, everything, the grass, the, the greenery is around the, the fence. And then when she returns to Hawaii, she takes the rock with her and returning to the land, you know. <clears throat> so I just close the it, circle there. It's very weird with Hawaii with, with me where there is, even when I get off the plane, there is, as soon as I, as soon as I, because the thing about Hawaii is that it, just being there elicits the imagination. You, you just cannot believe what you're seeing. You cannot believe where, you, it, it's just, it's so beautiful. And there is very much a sense of when, I, when I'm there, it feels like holy land, feels like, like if I, ever I visit either Haleakala or Kilauea, uh, one of the volcanoes, I, do, I bring an offering of some sort, just a flower or something. You know, I'm, just, I'm very acknowledging of, um, because that land is alive. That land is, is really alive and, and holds within it such power and, and such history and such, such um, uh, spiritual history in some ways that it just feels important to, to honor where you are. Yeah. Yes, and I think it's important to honor the land everywhere we, we go, Terrible. even here in North America, even before we start working the land or do something, even a ceremony, we should uh, you know, pay our homages and uh, right. respect to, right. to the land. I mean, yeah. this is what I learned from my few ceremonies I went through. <laughs> Um, what did you learn from the, the Far East? Because I read in, in your book that you also went there and <clears throat> met with some teachers. How was that teaching different than, than the other ones? The Far East was, um, uh, what, what can I say about that? Uh, particularly Bali and Thailand. Uh, you know, I mean, they're, they're, you know, Bali is more Hindu, Thailand is more, more Buddhist. Um, I, I couldn't really find all that much difference it, they just they feel so shamanic they just feel like shamanic cultures you know and and um 
I can't I can't emphasize enough about how how much shamanic culture centers around love. I just it, it just it is so much a part of it, and and it just feels like in those places that that um, that when that a sin or a missing of the mark has to do with I can't find the love here. I can't feel my love here. You know, and, and this, this anger or this, or this reactivity that I'm happening, that, that's happening in me, doesn't allow me to actually access what I'm supposed to be accessing all the time. That's more than anything else. That's really what I got from, uh, from working in the Far East, just, just how much it really is about love. Interesting. Yes. Um, do you still organize uh, workshops or sorry, retreats in, in South America? And do you have um, a favorite uh, plant medicine? Uh, yeah. Uh, well, I, did, I took a break from, um, from the retreats mainly because of COVID. And, you know, now that I'm moving to, to Hawaii, particularly with, uh, you know, with the, with the book on Hawaiian spirituality, um, I'll, be doing, I'll be doing retreats in, you know, out of Maui when I, when I get there. I'm moving next month. So it'll take a little while to set all that up. Um, I spent uh, about uh, almost two months in Brazil. This is many years ago, working, working with uh, shamans there and working with ayahuasca. Um, you know, for me personally, I feel like the pilgrimage down there to actually do the medicine is as much a part of the medicine as the medicine. It's about, I'm going on a quest. And again, because we're creating our reality, as soon as you, in, as soon as you create the intention of I'm going somewhere that isn't very comfortable, where there are very big bugs, very big bugs and snakes and, uh, and, and spiders and, and, uh, and fires that like come out of nowhere. And it's, it, um, uh, it, it was a terrifying time in Brazil. Um, uh, that, that's as much, uh, as much as anything um, about the plant medicine. The other thing that, was, that happened to me during that time, because we're going back like 12, 12, 15 years, was that the shaman that I was working with immediately treated me, he, he didn't treat me like the student on the retreat, You know, he treated me like, you know, if someone was having a problem, he'd go like that and point and he'd make me go help, you know, and I didn't tell, I didn't, you know, at that time, I didn't tell him that, you know, that I was, um, uh, that I was a healer or anything, but, and he didn't even speak English, but there was just the sense that he recognized something in me that was like, yeah, the, the, you're not so much here just for you. Like, go, you know, you need to hear from me that you need to go help that person. It was very much that, but, you know, in terms of ayahuasca, ayahuasca is an opener, You know, particularly, you know, if you haven't been doing a lot of work on yourself, it can really bite you in the butt, you know, because it really brings all that, you know, it really brings all that stuff up. Um, uh, for me personally, I had a couple difficult experiences, although not, not that difficult, um, and some beautiful experiences, you know. But, but for me personally, I actually find that, that, um, that I'm at a point now where entering into an altered state, which is really the point of, plant medicine or monotonous drumming or, or uh, uh, anything like that. It's, it's relatively easy for me. It's really, it, you know, I just, I know how to, I know how to get there without the medicine, you know, and, uh, and it's better to do it based on your own skill set than it is medicine because you got to wait for the medicine to wear off, you know. Um, uh, but, uh, but, but I've also had clients who've been working with me for, let's say, a year And then they will go do a therapeutically led mushroom ceremony. And after that ceremony, they'll come back to my office and everything we've been working on with it for the year, it's just like integrated. It's like the, there's a sense of like everything we've talked about, I get it now. And there's a sense of like, we can move on to the next thing because I get it. And that's been really interesting to see that, that, um, that the plant medicine in, um, in conjunction with therapeutic attention on your stuff because we all have our stuff we're all supposed to be working on our stuff you know that that in some way that that that, that the plant medicine really helped to integrate um that material i've seen that a lot yeah so you have the the practice in new york city um what's going to happen with it if you move to to hawaii Well, COVID has, you know, put, put a lot of things, I've been able to do a lot of work online. Um, you know, that's, that's really changed. Um, and I also, I also think, uh, um, uh, you know, I, I just, I'm just very called to go, 
you know, I'm, I'm, I'm leaving something behind. I'm, my, practice, my practice operates on a wait list. I mean, I do very well here. And, um, uh, and so in that way, it's kind of counterintuitive, but, but it's time for me to go. It's time, you know, for my own, um, and, and I'll have a different practice there. I'll, I'll have my, my New York people that I see virtually, you know, but I also think that, that um, I'll, you know, I'll find people, people who are visiting the island or who live on the island that, that I work with individually as well. So uh, it's just, uh, you know, it's, it's one of those things that, that I am, I am letting go of something, but that, that land is, is, uh, is calling me in a way that, that um, it's the only place I want to be. It's very weird. It's the only place I want to be in right now. So you have to continue your own journey, regardless of, you know, I mean, you have to have, have, help people, but again, you have to continue your own journey for sure. Right. That's right. So after you realize that this is your calling, how your decision impact the impacted the family and your relationship with Dominique and everyone else around you. It was that a uh, strenuous uh, approach or, or not? Well, let me say this. Uh, rather than answer that question in terms of me, let me just say what I think a lot of your listeners are going through, which is that um, when you decide to truly follow a spiritual path, to follow, your, to follow a soul's journey, to go on a hero's journey, um, it's going to feel counterintuitive. It's going to weird. It's going to feel weird. It's going to feel like imposter syndrome. It's going to feel like who's going to pay for it. It's going to feel like you know all of all of those things. And and it will and it will feel absolutely like an identity crisis. That's not for some people. I see it with every even the most gifted healers who are who are developing into healers. You know, they're at a certain point they go, "Am I crazy?" You know, that's why that's why the idea of even spiritual madness is like a thing. You know, because there is a sense of what am I doing, you know? And so like everyone goes through um, uh, a kind of identity crisis. It's like, who am I on Facebook now? You know, if, if, I, if, I'm, if I'm choosing this and I'm not choosing that. So, so it's, just, it's just something that everyone goes through. And, and the only thing I can say about it is that just know that that's part of it you know, and, and um, know that it really is a crisis, an identity crisis. And, and if you can find someone to work with who, who understands the spiritual path, because on that path, there is a point where everyone goes, this is off the deep end. Family doesn't understand, friends don't understand, old job doesn't understand, um, all of it, you know, and where, where you're just following these, your own inner directives and you can't find your own experience mirrored back necessarily. Yes, and this is a crisis which won't be solved through drugs or booze or, you know, a new expensive car or, you know, an affair. Right. No, you have to really face your, your fear and, and move forward, find a, a teacher like yourself and um, work on it. Otherwise, you're going to be stuck. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. so I recommend uh, everyone to, to read uh, The Shaman's Mind. It's a great uh, book. And uh, we are approaching the end of the, the interview. Any final thoughts, uh, Jonathan? Uh, any final thoughts? Um, if anything resonated in terms of what's going on in the world right now, uh, uh, if anything resonated, it should resonate because that's what's going on in the world right now. And, um, and I think it's important that if, that were, if the idea of this change, this ascension, this, this fact that we can't keep going as we are, and if there's a sense that you identify with that, claim your seat, claim your seat as, uh, as a change maker in your own individual way, whatever that looks like. In your, but but um, just know that like you're here in order to usher in this change whatever that looks like for you. And if it looks growthful and loving and more empathic and with an intentionality of connection, you're doing it. But claim it actually as, as an identity for yourself. So that's what I would say, that's what I would leave everyone with. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time. Uh, I wish you all the best in, in Hawaii. I know you, you'll do well there and Pele will take care of you. Mahalo, um, thank you so Mahalo. much. And um, for my uh, viewers, uh, thank you for, for watching, share it, um, like it. Um, and uh, you know, you can also support me on uh, patreon.com slash Claudio Murgan. Uh, and until next time, love and gratitude.